from your word. Would you guide us, help us to see what you'd want us to see and know what we need to know so that we can live the way that you'd have us to live. And so, Lord, we look forward to hearing from you this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this morning we're going to be taking a little bit of a journey. We're going to be in the book of John primarily. We're going to be looking at John 13 through 16, uh, but we're also going to be just flying around a few different passages of Scripture as we go through this morning. Uh, The Scripture passages will be on the screen. Uh, You can read along with that. However, as you see in your bulletin, we don't have any fill-in-the-blanks this morning, so um, write whatever you want to write, as long as you're not writing mean things about me. Uh, So... um, but in all, in all seriousness, as we get ready to, to dive into John 13 through 16, the reason this passage really stood out to me, um, and as you see the title of the sermon is Parting Words. Now obviously, uh, this is my last time sharing, um, sharing from this pulpit. Uh, I know the Lord has many other opportunities for me and for this church, but for now, this will be the last time publicly I can address everyone. So there's parting words here. I... And I wanted to think about what, were, what would be the last thing that I'd want to leave with this church. But in addition to that, this is also going to be our grad recognition, uh, recognition service. Graduates are moving on to new th- things in life as well. And so I was thinking, what would be the last words I would want for a graduate who is moving from uh, high school on to the big world? And, and what would those words be? And how would, I, how would I want to communicate those? And I just kept coming back to the fact that I am not the only one I am definitely not the first one, and I will definitely not be the last one that has ever come before a group of people and has had the opportunity to give parting words, a final address. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, well, we could go back and look at all the different Bible characters even, that as they were about to leave, whether it was because they knew they were going to die or for whatever reason they were going to be moving on, they always would leave people with words to help them live as they move forward. So I was thinking about Moses, I was thinking about Joshua, I was thinking about several other uh, characters that we see, the, the people who God has used throughout history. But then I came to John and I realized a good section of the book of John is Jesus' parting words to his disciples. And what more perfect words could be shared than the very words that came from Jesus' mouth as he knew that he was about to give his life and Things were going to change. And Jesus gave many words to his disciples. And in John, we see as they sit together for their final supper together, as they have that time together, he teaches them and shows them things that he wants them to remember after he's gone. And I felt and thought this would be perfect. Perfect to share with graduates, perfect to share with this church, and quite honestly, perfect to even share for myself. So as we look at John 13 through 16, we want, we're going to frame this in understanding that Jesus leaves a challenge for his disciples, and today I want that same challenge that he left for the disciples that were with him on that day, I want the same challenge to be given out to our graduates, yes, and also to our entire church. I want to look at def- several different passages, we're going to break it up in, little, in smaller pieces, and we're going to see what Jesus wants to communicate to his people. I want to read, just go to John chapter 13 before we jump into all of his specific advice. And I want to show you where this indeed is going to be Jesus' last words to his disciples, his followers. Uh, He says it himself in John chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, just the first part of verse 4. It says, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. And that's where we see he then jumps in and starts to show and to teach the things that he wants his disciples to know. He knows the time is short. 
He knows this is it. This is the time he's going to communicate the biggest things that he wants them to remember as, they, as he gives his life for them, and they don't even fully understand what that's going to look like. But he wants these last words to be what they will live by. And he doesn't only use words, but as I've said several times, he also will use his example. And we're going to look at both of those today. His words to them, his disciples, his followers that day are still his words to us. And this is what we're going to hear today as we look at the whole of this passage. We must abide in him by loving one another as seen through our service to one another. We're going to see those things are going to connect. We're going to see that, that Jesus is going to tell his disciples to abide in him and that by abiding in him, it's by love, we love one another. And as we abide in him and love one another, we will serve one another. Those are the three big things that Jesus is going to say. Now, there's a whole lot more here. You could plumb the depths of this for a very long time, much longer than we're going to have this morning. And I would encourage you to do that. But this morning, we're going to look at those three primary uh, things. We're actually going to not start right after verse 13. We're going to move forward. We're going to fast forward a little bit to chapter 15. I want to start there because this is kind of the core of Jesus' words to his disciples here. And then we're going to kind of go back and see how this section in 15 connects to passages in 13. Uh, And so we're going to look at that uh, today. And eventually we'll even get to John 14, but that'll be at the end of our time together. But let's look at chapter 15 as Jesus wants to tell his disciples about how they need to abide in him. So John 15, 1 through 17. A little lengthy here, but follow along with me. This is what Jesus says. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may, be, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, and ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that, your, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Jesus gives this parable, if you will, about a vine and a vine dresser and how the vine that produces the fruit, the grapes, cannot produce without the power of the branch, without the power of the vine. The vine has to give the branches what it needs in order to bear fruit. And there's a couple things that Jesus is really pointing out here. Uh, First of all, Big picture, Jesus tells us to abide in him. What does abiding in Jesus mean? Uh, There's lots of ways you could describe this. You could could get it deep down. I want to keep it very, very simple. Abiding in Jesus is to trust and follow Jesus' words and ways. It's to trust in Jesus, trust that he's providing what you need, just like the branch has to trust in the vine, right? So, uh, and so we trust in the vine, we trust in him and what he says and what he does, and we also follow him. We see and we get the source of our life from him as the vine, but we also see how to live, how to bear fruit. Jesus bear, bore fruit when he was here, and we need to bear fruit as well. So Jesus says, abide in me. As he's telling his disciples, what he wants them to remember is to abide in him, to, to maintain a relationship of trust and obedience to trust his words, to trust his ways, to know who he is and to follow who he is and what he's said. 
To abide in Jesus is the call of the Christian. Not simply just to come to Jesus so that he can save you, but to abide in him is much larger than that. It's to place our ongoing trust in him in a way that will allow us, that leads us to follow him as his disciples. And so Jesus says, abide in me. As part of abiding, then he goes on and talks in this passage about how Jesus says to bear fruit. Now, to bear fruit. Uh, we could go to the fruit of the Spirit passage, which we will later, and, and love, joy, peace, patience, all those, all those fruits of the Spirit, which we'll talk about later. Uh, we could talk about that being fruit, or many times people will say this is actually fruit, meaning like other people coming to know Jesus. Uh, either way, what we're seeing here, what, I, what Jesus is making very clear is if you abide in him, if you abide in the vine, if you trust him and you follow him, if you do that, then your life will be, will be observably productive. Your life will be observably productive. People will be able to see. Listen, fruit doesn't grow in secret. Fruit is out there for you to see, to pluck, okay? So it's there to take. And so the point here is he says, if you're going to bear fruit, it's going to, the abiding in Jesus will make a difference in how you live. Unfortunately, it's so many times in the church as a whole, we end up seeing a bunch of people who say they believe in Jesus, but there's nothing to be seen. There's nothing being produced. Actually, I, I'm afraid that what we've seen in the American church, and maybe even beyond that, is this understanding that I'm here to be a consumer. I'm here to get what I want and leave and feel happy. We're not called to be consumers. We're called to be producers. We are producing fruit as Jesus works through us, not simply here to come and collect fruit from other people. We need to make sure that to abide in Jesus, that our lives are being observably productive. We are, we are living out the, the abiding that we have in Christ. That it's not just in word, it's not just in how we feel, but it's in how we live. That's what Jesus is getting at. He's saying your faith, your abiding in him, your trust in his words and ways, your following Jesus as his disciple will show up in the way that we live. That's what he says. And then he goes on and clarifies that even further as we continue to read through this passage because then he goes on and says, the way you obey me, the way that your fruit is seen is by loving one another. He says that several times. He talks about the love that he has for God and God, and God the Father has for him and that we need to have that same love for one another. Now, we use the word love so casually in our, in our society and in our lives, but the love that Jesus is talking about, he makes very, very clear. In verses 12 and 13, this is what he says. This is my commandment. After telling them that they would follow his commandments, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, how has Christ loved us? Well, at this point, the disciples didn't even 100% understand yet. We do. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did. Jesus laid his very life down. He sacrificed himself for the good of his people. And he was foreshadowing that to the disciples, but we know looking back what Jesus did, that he died on that cross, that he, he, lived a, he lived a human life so that he could live a perfect life, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sin, for the times we've failed, for the times we've rebelled. And because we deserve death, he came in and instead and took on flesh, lived the perfect life so he could be the sacrifice we needed so that we could be saved from our sins by giving himself for us. And Jesus says, love each other the way I have loved you. There's no if, ands, or buts about this. This is not a, oh, choose to do this if you wish. This is Jesus saying, as I love you, you love one another. And so what does that mean for us? I don't believe that this means that all of us need to go out after service, build crosses, and literally die. However, there's a principle here that is clearer than day, and that is that love means sacrifice. Love means sacrifice. It means putting your needs and your wants and your good as secondary to the, the needs, wants, and good of another. That's what Jesus did for us. That's what we do for one another. 
We don't sit back and wait for people to serve us, but yet instead we go out and we sacrifice ourselves, our time, our talent, our money, whatever it might take. We sacrifice for the good of each other because that is how we love. Not because that's how we earn favor. Not because that's how other people will see us as good people, but that's because we love each other the way Jesus loved us. And when it's the hardest to do, which it's hard almost all the time, we have so much trouble truly loving one another and putting our own desires second over someone else. But in those moments where it's hard, all we need to do is think, Jesus loves me that much. The least I can do is to love another person by sacrificing of my life for them. That is his call here in John 15. To abide in Jesus is to trust and follow him, which will lead to observably productive fruit, which is seen in loving one another the way that Christ loved us, which is to sacrifice ourselves for each other. This can come out in any number of ways. But we understand that our call, that what Jesus wants us all to know is he's leaving his disciples behind. He says, this is the command. This is what I'm telling you to do. And notice, he doesn't list all the Ten Commandments. He doesn't give them a long rule book before he leaves. No, he says, this is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. We can't take that lightly. How many times do we justify not loving somebody else for whatever reason? Because we don't have the time, we don't have the energy, or they don't deserve it. Well, let me just tell you, we never deserved anything that Jesus did for us, and yet he died for us so that we could have forgiveness if we simply come to him and repent and believe in him. And when we do that, he gives us eternal life, something we never deserved, but that he gave everything to give us. And so do we also love one another the same way? And so Jesus here in John 15 is pretty clear. He says, abide in me, follow me, trust me, I will give, you will bear fruit as you do that, and that fruit will be seen as you love one another the way I've loved you. I do want to turn over today to Galatians chapter 5. I said we'd get to the fruit of the Spirit passage. And I do want to look at that, because this is the same general idea in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, we see this truth as clear as, as, clear as we can see it as Paul writes to the Galatian church. Galatians five thirteen through 26, and listen clear, carefully here. For you are called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For if the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And all those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. As we see the fruit of the Spirit here, we could break it down and look at each individual one and talk about it, but we see it starts with love and everything else flows from that. And we also see in verse 24 that Paul is reminding us that we crucify our flesh. We crucify all the things. We kill all the things. We sacrifice all of the things that in verse 19 are here. But notice there's some big ones here, sexual immorality, impurity, idolatry, sorcery. Okay, those are, yeah, okay, let's stay away from those. Uh, but then he also mentions some other ones that maybe aren't so clear. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. He puts all these in the same category as idolatry, as adultery, sexual immorality, orgies, drunkenness. And that is all these things, envy, divisions, dissensions, rivalry, fits of anger, 
Later on in verse 26, he says, if you're going to keep in step with the Spirit, you're not going to be conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. The understanding there that is implied is that we're doing the exact opposite of that, that we're being humble, and we're building each other up, and we're loving each other, and we are giving our best for one another. That is the understanding here. He starts back in verse 13, and he says, what is the, where is the whole law fulfilled? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he says very clearly, that the freedom that Christ has bought for us should bring us love through serving one another. Abiding in Jesus is the same as walking in the Spirit. It talks a lot about walking in the Spirit. Walking with the Spirit is actively loving God and loving others. Walking with the Spirit is abiding in Jesus. It's following Jesus' words that they, then the Holy Spirit teaches us through his word and we follow Jesus' ways as the Holy Spirit empowers us to do it. So walking by the Spirit is abiding in Jesus. That's what they are. It's the idea of following God. It's following Jesus with our whole heart. And again, that results in fruit, something observable. Instead of all these things that we listed, instead we see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, things that are seen because Christ has changed us from the inside out through his Spirit. And that's what we see in Galatians chapter 5. So Jesus says it in John 15 as he says the last words to his disciples. Paul says it in Galatians that we need to live in a way that is loving. We need to love one another and that is the fruit that we can see as we abide in Jesus and walk in the Spirit. But let's find ourselves now back to John. Back to John as Jesus is talking to his disciples earlier on in the conversation before we get to chapter 15 which we've already looked at. We find ourselves in John 13, back in verse 4, I've already introduced to John 13 that this was during the Passover, they were together, he wanted to pass on what he wanted them to know before he would leave, and in John 13, 4 through 17, and also verses 31 through 35, we're going to see some key ideas that we're going to kind of hone in on here. Let's go John 13, uh, starting verse 4. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what, am, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, then also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that's why he said, not all of you are clean. Now when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you are also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is this messenger greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you, for I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture, that, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Got it. Went a few extra verses there, but now we're going to jump down uh, to verses 31 through 35. And Jesus, when, Jesus had gone, when he had gone out, talking about Judas, who would betray Jesus, now he, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, and now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, and that you are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus makes things pretty clear here. So first of all, what we want to see as we go back in John 13 is Jesus tells us through his example and his words that we need to serve one another. Later on in the passage, he's going to get us back around to saying that we need to love one another. 
At the end of this passage in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. We've already talked about that. Sacrificial love that puts others before ourselves. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What does this tell you? Love is observable. Love is not just an a invisible feeling. It's not just something that's in our gut. Love is observable. Love is action. And how does Jesus show us what love is? Go back to the earlier in chapter 13. He washes the disciples' feet. A dirty, disgusting job that really was not meant for the leader, the teacher. That would have been meant for a slave. And yet Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. He serves them and then says, go and do the same thing. Here's what Jesus is saying through his example and his words. He's saying this very simply, that our calling as his followers, if we are to abide in him, as we've already talked about in John 15, if we are to follow Jesus, the way we do that is that we will demonstrate love for one another. So, again, as we think back to uh, who we're talking to today, uh, graduates who are here today, uh, you need to abide in Jesus Uh, You need to follow Christ's example, and you need to demonstrate love to people. Church, we need to do the same. We need to abide in Jesus. We need to follow his example by serving one another as we love one another. That is clearly seen here in the book of John in these chapters. John wants his disciples to know some very basic things, and it's this. You abide in me by loving one another through serving one another. This is how the church works. This is how life works. It's by loving God, abiding in him, by serving one another sacrificially in the love that we have. That is what he's calling us to do. And I want to look at a couple other passages now in the New Testament that will hone on this a little bit more. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. We've talked about these so many times, but I think we need to go back here. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes." Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint by which it is equipped, when, ev- when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Watch what Paul is saying here in Ephesians chapter 4. Now indeed, he starts by saying that he has gifted the church leaders in all these different ways, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherds, and teachers, pastors, that's what he's talking about there, so that the saints can be equipped for ministry. To What is ministry? It's to serve one another. But don't miss the very last word in this passage, that as we serve one another, the body grows so that it builds itself up in love. The work of ministry in church and in life is done by the people of God. Not just by a select few, but by every part. Notice that. Here in Ephesians chapter 4, we're told this. That he's saying, he's talking to the church, and what he says is that the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, it's saying that every single part, each part... Every single person, every single follower of Jesus is a part of the body of Christ and therefore should be equipped to serve one another. To serve one another so the church gets built up in love. Every person needs to serve for the good of the church, for the love of others. Love and service in this passage we see will bring unity and growth. This church has every opportunity to continue to grow and to thrive no matter what would happen here, no matter who would leave or come or go because the people of this church are followers of Jesus and therefore you have everything you need to serve one another in love so that this church can be built up. And can I just say a personal note here? I am praying for you that you will rise up 
to serve and to fill in any holes that may, may be provided here. You don't, the church here has a body, has people that are ready. Every single part here can come together. This church can grow in unity. It can grow in strength. It can grow in its spiritual life and the way that it impacts the community as you work together. Every single person doing the work of the ministry. Not just trusting a few people to do ministry. That's going to burn people out. It's going to make it so that this doesn't work. Every single person, no matter how young or old, no matter how much you think you know or don't know, find a place to serve one another. In homes and in the church, serve each other in love. First Peter also tells us the same thing. First Peter verses four, or chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. This is one of my all-time favorite passages of Scripture because it reminds us of what we are called to do and why. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. Watch where Peter starts here. The end of all things is at hand. Okay, talking about farewell uh, words, parting words. He's saying, the end of all things is at hand. Now, it's even closer than it was when he wrote this. The end of all things is at hand. So what does he say? As we get to the end, this is what we need to know. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. How do we bring glory to God through Jesus Christ? We do it as we serve one another. And above all, when we keep loving one another earnestly. Again, every time we use this word love, let us keep it in context. What is love? Jesus already told us. To sacrifice ourselves for others. So our calling here, the way we glorify God, the way we glorify Jesus is when we put ourselves beside ourselves and we sacrifice our good, we sacrifice our lives for the love of others, for the sake of others, to serve one another, to step up when we need people to step up, when someone needs to be encouraged, when someone needs help, we need to be there. When the church needs help, we need to be there. The calling of the Christian is not just to come to church, sit on the chair, learn a lot of stuff, and be happy. We are happy as we serve one another. He will give us joy. Remember, Jesus said that back in John. He said, if you love one another, my joy will be in you. That's what he wants for us. He wants true joy, and that will only come as we love one another, by serving each other, by using our gifts, so that he will be glorified. The end of all things is at hand, therefore... Be self-controlled, sober-minded, and above all, keep loving one another earnestly. As we've looked at Jesus' words in John chapter 13 through 16, uh, we haven't looked at all of it, but I would encourage you, read the whole section there. You'll see what he's saying. It becomes abundantly clear. There is one message, and that one message is, when I leave, abide in me by loving one another through serving one another. That is what he says. Those are his last words, and if those are his last words that he wanted his disciples to understand before he died, then let's listen to him. Let's listen to him and love one another earnestly, love each other by serving each other, abiding in him, walking in the spirit, so that he will receive glory and so that the church will be built up in love. That is what his calling is on our lives. That is his final words, his parting words before he would go. So in conclusion... And don't close your Bibles yet. We have another passage to look at in a moment. But in conclusion, as I talk to graduates and to this church, I don't ultimately want you to listen to my parting words. I know that's what these may be. Don't worry about what I say, but listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says, love one another, abide in me sacrificially love one another through serving one another, this church will flourish, this church will thrive if we love and serve one another and put our own feelings, our misgivings, our frustrations, if we can put those beside us, sacrifice ourselves for one another. And I keep saying us because 
we're still part of the same body. We might not be with each other, but we are still in the body of Christ. And we will continue to serve him. And my call, my, my, my call is to serve, your call is to serve. We need to serve and love one another wherever Christ may put us. That is how God will be glorified. Grads, it's pretty simple for you. As you graduate high school, if you want to bring glory to God with your life, wherever you go and with whatever you do, it becomes very simple. It doesn't matter where you end up. It doesn't matter what job you end up in. It doesn't matter if you live at home with mom and dad for another 10 years or if you never stay there again. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that you follow Jesus, you abide in him, you love others, and you serve others, that you sacrifice yourself for the good of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And church, if we want to bring glory to God, if you want to bring glory to God as Jesus has given us the call, that you will strive to grow and thrive in love and unity, to love one another, to put yourselves behind and put others forward. Because that's how we love God. We love God through loving others. That is clear through John's book, through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. You can look at all of those passages through Scripture that we love one another. As we love one another, that is loving God. Loving God and loving others come together when we sacrifice ourselves for the good of those who he has placed us with. Now, at this point, you might be saying, this is too hard. It's too hard to love people that way. To that I can say, amen. (laughs) It is hard. Very, very hard. Actually impossible. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't. If this church is going to grow and glorify God, grads, if your life, if you're going to glorify God in your life, then you can't just rely on yourself. You can't just rely on yourselves. It is too hard. Jesus knew that. Jesus gives them all this. He tells them, he washes their feet. He says, go do likewise. He says, love one another as I have loved you. Like, Jesus is perfect. He was able to do this. We're not. So Jesus knew that. And so in chapter 14, I want to draw our attention to John 14, 18 through 26 and see his promise that he gives us in the midst of his commandment. He commands us to love one another, but he doesn't leave us without a promise. This is how good and gracious our Lord is. Again, we're in John 14. We're going to start right in verse 18. Actually, I'll go back to 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you have heard is not mine, but the father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring into your remembrance all All that I have said to you, we're going to continue. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. As Jesus, then he breaks into talking about how he is the true vine. But as he says that, if we remember back in verse 15, or chapter 15, he does end up saying, you can do nothing apart from me. Jesus says that in 15, he says it clearly in 14. He's saying, listen, here is the call of the Christian. Love one another, serve one another, sacrificially put yourself aside and love one another. Do it to abide in me. 
But then he says, but listen, as you abide in me, I abide in you. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit that we have all received when we come to know Jesus as our Savior, God lives in us and can work through us in ways that we can never do on our own. That is the truth that is given to us here in John 14. He is very clear that he says he will not leave us as orphans. So yes, loving one another and serving each other sacrificially, it's hard, it's impossible, but it can be done because Jesus can do it through us, through his Spirit. And so trust the Holy Spirit, trust Jesus, follow what he says, listen to his word, because that's how he speaks to us, that's how he changes us. We look to his word, we allow the Holy Spirit to use that word in our lives to change us from the inside out, and then, even though you will find, you will find yourselves loving people in a way you never imagined you could, because you simply have trusted that God will help you to do so, because he has not left us as orphans. He is with us. He will always be with us. He will never leave us. No matter where we go or what we do, grads, any one of us here, he will always be with us. We can't run away from God and praise him for that. We know that he's with us, and so we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We can love one another through his strength, through his love. At the end of the day, we're about to sing a song. I'll call the worship team up. You guys can start making your way up. This, over the years, has become one of my absolute favorite songs. And I'm so glad that we picked it up and started singing it here. In all that we've talked about today, there's a lot of songs we could have chosen. As the reminder to us all, in Jesus' parting words to his disciples, and now as I share them with you for the last time, we, what we understand today is this. We must abide in Jesus by loving one another through serving one another. It goes together. If you're here claiming to be a Christian, then it should show up in the way you treat one another. And if we go forward from here, as we go our separate ways, Jesus doesn't go any separate ways. He's still here. He's still with you. He's still with me. And as we trust in him, as we lean into the Holy Spirit and the strength he provides, even in the times that we can't hold ourselves up, Christ will hold us fast. He holds us. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we are in his hands. And so as we remember that we are in the hands of Christ, we are with him always. Let us rise together and sing, he will hold me fast.